Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokos Mystery. This will be part 265. <clears throat> we're looking at the title, The Spirit of Error. <clears throat> public. Yes, public. Now, what we find, the scripture tells us that man is consistently being influenced by spirits. And spirits impart conditions. <clears throat> There's a spirit of jealousy, a spirit of fear, <clears throat> a lying spirit. <clears throat> the Bible gives us a running account of the manifestations and the results of the imposition of these conditions on the human order. Today we want to pursue a little bit about what the scripture says pertaining to the spirit of error. So let's turn to the book of 1 John, 4th chapter, verse 6. <clears throat> first John, first chapter, verse six. <clears throat> we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. <clears throat> now, he, John puts forth an interesting principle. He says if an individual has the spirit of God, he is going to hear the word of God, the way the word of God has been intended to be presented. If he is under the influence of the spirit of error, he cannot hear the word of God in its fullness, in its purpose, in its intent. <clears throat> now the word error comes from a Greek term, planeo, which literally means delusion. Also, deception. Now this is illustrated in two forms. Planeo is a verb which means the action of entering into delusion. Planei is the noun, the condition, the fullness of having entered into delusion and residing in that condition. Scripture teaches this condition comes into the life of a person in different ways. The main way is the person hearkens unto the words which are error of a person who is speaking under the influence of the spirit of error. Turn Ephesians 4th chapter verse 14. <clears throat> That we, the word henceforth there is in the italics. It wasn't in the original Greek, so we're not going to include it in this rendition of the scripture. That we be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight. The word slight there comes from a Greek term meaning cunning of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. <clears throat> whereby they lie in wait literally to bring the person into a condition of delusion note two things here 
he talks about children. In other words, <clears throat> a Christian who does not mature is wide open to be brought into a state of delusion. Most Christians never enter into a state of maturity. They remain children, hence <clears throat> in their spirit of delusion. <clears throat> now, Scripture warns, warns the saint to guard himself against entering into the state of delusion at the end time, particularly of all the times in the church that has existed, this is the time in which the state of delusion is going to be most prevalent. <clears throat> Turn to Matthew 24, verses 3 to 4. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what the sign of thy coming in the end of the age? So the disciples wanted to know when they would be aware. What is the first thing they would be aware of that would herald the ending of the age in the imminence, the preeminence of his appearing. And the first thing he says in verse 4 is, Take heed that no man deceive you. <clears throat> Take heed that no man plane <clears throat> put you into a state of delusion about the time. Then he goes on to explain that the church would be in a state of delusion because it would be sitting under the influence of the spirit of error. Four, four, preposition connecting these two principles. For many shall come in my name, saying I am Christ, and shall deceive, and shall deceive, and shall deceive. Many put many in a state of delusion about the reality of his appearing in the time of the end of the age. Now, <coughs> we find that <coughs> the spirit of delusion is manipulated by Satan. Turn to Revelation 12th chapter verses 8 to 9. <coughs> Mr. Jones, <clears throat> these scriptures that we are just now reading can be directly applied to the gathering and the beginning of signs. Yes. Is that what you're teaching us right here? Right yes. Now? Okay. Yes. <coughs> because it's not taught about the gathering so, of course, there's going to be somebody saying, well, go here, he's over here, he's over there. There's going to be many, many confusing, you know, options for the humans to uh, consider if you don't know what's happening, what, what time it is. Yes. Revelation 12, chapter, verses 8 to 9. explaining the motive <clears throat> the activity of Satan throughout the period <clears throat> leading into and ending in the tribulation era <clears throat> the war in heaven Satan's kicked out 
prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth, deceiveth, <coughs> keeps the world in a state of delusion. The whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels cast out with him. Now Satan, at the time of the gathering, is going to be the chief deceiver of the front runners of the Luciferians. But the second half, he's going to be put aside. Others are going to exceed his ability to deceive. But that won't happen until long after the sons of God are gone. <clears throat> What we have is a progressive level of intensity of deception. <clears throat> the Luciferians deceive now indirectly. You can't see the source of the deception. When we enter into this altered state of reality, you're going to see the individual that's doing the deceiving. So at, the, at this time, the Satan, the accuser, is only able to deceive up to a certain point because of the restrainer. Mm -hmm. He won't be allowed to go past a certain point because the Father's plan for the Prototokos has not been completed. So then that was also true of after the beginning of Soros, once we're into new reality, because but, the restrainer is still on the earth. But on a decreasing level. <clears throat> but everywhere else, increasing. Yes. Yes. Father will not allow interference to the point where his plan cannot go right. forth. Now, having said that, I want to focus on something even more intense. We said a person can be deceived in many ways. One has to do with hearing words of deception, hearkening to the words of deception, being spoken by somebody who's already under the influence of deception right. and draws that person into the same condition. <clears throat> There's an even worse way that a person can be deceived, and that is through the spirit, the spirit of deception that dwells within himself. Mm. <clears throat> Where did that come from? The fall. Every individual is indwelled by what's called the sin spirit. The sin spirit is a spirit of deception. Mm -hmm. Turn to Jeremiah 17th chapter, verse 9. <coughs> <Nature. coughs> the heart is deceitful above all and desperately wicked. Who can know it? What is he referring to the heart? He's referring to the fallen nature of man, but he's zeroing in on the sin spirit that indwells every man. Turn to James, fourth chapter, verse five. Did you say verse 5? Uh-huh. People go to hell because they delude themselves. Yes. James 4, chapter, verse 5. <clears throat> Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us, mm -hmm. the spirit that dwelleth in us, lusteth to envy. What does that mean? The spirit that dwells in us is a powerful influence. And its desire is to fulfill its own desires through the host that it inhabits. It's going to impart lusts, desires of its own, 
to the vessel it inhabits, and the vessel it inhabits thinks that its desire is what it wants, and it goes to go after what the sin spirit is directing it to. When did this happen? Way over Genesis, fourth chapter. Turn to Genesis, the fourth chapter. <clears throat> Notice how the act activity of planes is suddenly picked up. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprising. Uh. <clears throat> <clears throat> Genesis, the fourth chapter. We're going to start in <clears throat> verse 4, Cain and Abel. <clears throat> Cain brings forth an offering he gives to the Lord. Abel brings forth an offering he gives to the Lord. Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. You notice the two differences. Cain just took from the ground uh, a percentage of what he was um, laboring on. Mm -hmm. Abel took the choicest of what he had. He was willing to sacrifice <clears throat> because he wanted to show his love for YHVH. So if uh, Cain had given the best of what he's grown, it would have been different? Yes, but Cain wouldn't. Why? Because Cain was corrupted. Abel wasn't. <clears throat> Cain gets rebuked. Uh, <clears throat> verse 4. Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Now Cain <clears throat> got an attitude because uh, he didn't receive the result of what he thought he was going to receive. Verse 6, The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? In other words, why is VH to tell him why you got an attitude? I'm going to tell you why I didn't have respect for your offering. It says, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. He said, You weren't accepted. Your offering wasn't accepted because you're not accepted. Because... <clears throat> You live a life that's a detestation in my sight. So how do you think I'm going to receive something from you when your life is not pleasing to me? If you do well, if you live in accordance with my righteous standard, I'm going to accept what you have to give me. But if you live, Cain was an egoistical, maniacal, he, one of the first that really had <clears throat> uh, uh, chosen to walk the left-hand path. He, he lived a life that was totally in opposition to God. We, receive, we see that because he winds up murdering his own brother. So his heart was black. He was an evil individual. And talks about that in 1 John, or 4 John, somewhere around here, where Cain was of that wicked one. He followed Satan. He followed the serpent. He didn't follow YHVH because he was a tear. So so he's the first tear. Yeah, so the Lord tells him, you're, you're not acceptable to me. Your offering is not acceptable to me because you're not acceptable to me. Then he goes on to tell him something else. One quick question. Sure. Did uh, Adam and Eve, or Adam or Eve, recognize that he was a tear? No. Mm. No. Mr. Jones. Yeah. <clears throat> The, the, the scenario, the, the, the picture that's painted right here is that there's a day where Cain and Abel both give sacrifices to the Lord. Now, was it a mandate? Was it because they were required to give a... No, it's Cain's idea. Hmm. He thought he was going to make brownie points with YHVH. Right. That's like somebody that goes to church, uh, you know, <clears throat> he gets off the, off the bar stool, 
staggers on down into church and he gives the, a big offering in the collection plate. You know, the Lord's going to be satisfied with that. How do we see that it's Cain's idea? Because it says something. Where? <clears throat> Verse 3. In the process of time, <clears throat> it came to pass that Cain yeah, brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. So he did it free will. Of his own volition, yeah. <clears throat> now, here's the key to all this. Verse 7. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin. Sin. This is a pronoun. This is an individual. Right. Named. Sin lieth at the door. And unto thee, his desire. His. It's a sentient being. This is a spirit. His desire shall be. <clears throat> And thou shalt rule over him. What does this mean? When we look, compare James, compare Genesis. James says the spirit that dwells in us lusteth to envy. YHVH tells Cain, if you continue to live the way you're living, there is a spirit that is going to inhabit you. And this spirit is going to desire to fulfill its lusts through you and you're going to spend your time trying to keep it under control. Let me quickly point out that there may be some of us who believe, having heard this, that the spirit that's in humans, in every single human, is the fault. In other words, the, the human has no fault, no part in this at all. So can you just clarify that just because we're pointing out here that the, the spirit is the uh, activator, that the person who's being activated has some part in the problem. Most definitely. <clears throat> God holds that person responsible to yielding. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So Cain, going about his, bu his business and decides, oh, I'm going to give an offering to the Lord. Now, where does that thought come from? Because that seems to be a good intention. But I'll just put this, you know, just pick that up there, there, there's your offering. He does no, he puts no thought into, if he's going to please the Lord, then he's going to think, okay, maybe I should give him something good. But no, he just takes whatever's available and shoves that as, look, look what I did. So the motivation so, is wrong. Yeah. Yes. And, and, yes. The fact, and the fact that he did it and then Abel followed suit, that he enabled being the good brother, why didn't he think of it first? Well, hang on one second. Huh? Exactly. There's manipulation involved here, based on what you've just said. If if the motivation is not correct, he's already trying to manipulate the white tree. Certainly. Mm. Certainly. <coughs> People do it all the time. He's, he's not trying actually to gain trying to give anything safer. to white tree. He's just trying to draw attention to himself as doing something extraordinary. No, he's trying to he's trying to curry favor with YHVH. Why? By giving this offering. So he can get blessed. He sees Abel, the life Abel is living, that he's jealous of to begin with. Okay. And he says, well, I'm going to do something to put me in the same position that right. he's in. Right. I'm going to get, you know, the, the Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags before okay. God. This implies that he doesn't realize he's a tear. He doesn't look, no, he's in deception. Sure. Told me. He got offended. He says, I'm doing you a good work. Why aren't you receiving it right. from me? Right. He got mad. Why mm -hmm. says, why did you get mad? I'm <laughs> going to tell you why I didn't receive it. <laughs> well, this is why it's Elohim has the same outlook. You're going to bring your dirty, filthy offering to me because right. of thinking I'm going <laughs> to accept this? Right. Hey, Jesus talks about it. You bring your gift to the altar and you've got something that you've done in your life. Your gift's not going to be accepted until you go and make it right. God isn't looking at the offering. He's looking at the person that offers its life. Hold it, yeah. Okay, I'm going to go into this main theme. The principle we want to see here is what YHVH tells Cain. He says, if you do not do well, in other words, if you do not line your life up with my principles, sin is going to indwell you. The human race 
has a generation curse upon it because everybody did the same thing that Cain did. They went out of the way and the sin spirit inhabited them and dwelled them. Turn to Romans, the fifth chapter. First 12. <laughs> Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. Because of what Adam did, he opened the door for the sin spirit to come back into man's domain. Should we understand that for Cain, it's not necessarily his first act of allowing sin to control him? No, his no. life was a, a, a habit of right. That's just curious, egregious sir. behavior. Why GH points this out? at that particular point and I'm just wondering were there other acts of Cain that hadn't been uh, uh, addressed? Sure, his whole life. Okay. <clears throat> but the sin spirit didn't indwell him. The reason he was the character he was was because he was following the serpent. It corrupted his, his whole view. Why didn't the sin spirit indwell him? It did. I thought you just said it didn't. Before that. Okay. When he was offering Making his offering, the sin spirit wasn't inhabiting him. Okay. He did that. <coughs> okay, I understand. What you it's mean. nature, right? By nature, because he was following the serpent. Okay. Engendering a habit of evil, wickedness, which was fertile ground for the sin spirit to come in and indwell him. Okay. okay. <coughs> so this proves then that the sin nature can come from the indwelling spirit, the, the spirit of sin, the serpent the veil and i'm sure there are other areas where this can well uh, the idea is this the inference is when adam and eve came out of the garden white's vh came out so did the serpent right and it spread around the world okay. the serpent was the individual his influence was the generating force of the whole gotcha. human race that's why they rejected white's vh when nimrod did what he did they looked at Nimrod with admiration and they put down YHVH. It said Nimrod, the mighty hunter, before the Lord. We okay. recognize Nimrod before First, we recognize right. you. Only a, a handful of people, starting with Enoch, walk with God. But what we find here is the cause of what happened with the human race. Notice what it says. Verse 12, whereby is one man sin entered into the world the sin spirit came into the world because of adam's disobedience mm -hmm. but the whole human race didn't come under condemnation only adam and eve came under condemnation what happened notice what it goes on to say and death by sin and so death passed upon all a l l all men for that all have sinned. Everybody adopted Cain's lifestyle. Therefore, the sin spirit had free access to and dwell everybody. And this is what killed the human race. They brought a death sentence on themselves, eagerly following the delusion of the serpent. Hmm. Now, Paul talks about this. Turn to 1 Corinthians, 7th chapter. Paul illustrates the struggle that everybody has with the sin nature. 1 Corinthians, 7th chapter, starting verse 14. <clears throat> Here Paul talks about <clears throat> the law of sin and death, which is activated when the human race fell. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. It's got the sin spirit indwelling in. For that which I do I allow not. For that what I do, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. 
If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the Lord that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. That's the response to your question originally. Okay. Is it the person? No. It's the sin spirit in the person right. that is motivating the person to respond to its lust. Mm -hmm. For, for I know that in me that is in my flesh, fallen nature, carnal nature, dwelleth no good thing. Now most people look at this and say, well, there's, when he says dwelleth no good thing, they're looking at it as to say, well, there's nothing good that's in me. That's not what he's saying. He's saying there's something in me, but it's no good. It's evil. It's wicked. For to wit, is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I, the daughter repeats it, but sin. Sin, the same sin spirit that was in Cain, <clears throat> that dwelleth in me. So he goes on to talk about the struggle that every Christian has. You have dual nature. The sin nature is always going to try to dominate. That was right. HVH told that to Cain way yes. back in Genesis. He said, you're going to spend your time trying to keep this thing under control if you don't change and follow my precepts. Well, it's too late now. Everybody has a sin spirit indwelling in them. David talks about it. He said, iniquity was I conceived. You come into this world, you come in with a sin spirit. 